Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by the Hockey Podcast Network, as well as DraftKings. Joining us right now is a very special guest. We welcome back for his second appearance on the show, Jesse Marshall of The Athletic, as well as the Dying Alive podcast. How's it going, Jesse? Doing well, gentlemen. Busy day. Good to see you. Exciting, exciting day to be a hockey fan. Oh, most definitely. From the second you wake up today, because clearly we weren't going to wait till noon, until the second we go to bed today, there's going to be a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah, we decided to record this. <laughs> Perfect time, though, literally. At 12.30 <laughs> p.m. Uh, of free agency day, we're literally 30 minutes in, and all of the news is flying out in front of us. <laughs> yeah. Well, since the last time we actually talked, Jesse, a lot has changed for you in your personal life. So I do want to ask you, first of all, congratulations. I don't know if I, I've been able to tell you it in person, congratulations, but also how has fatherhood been treating you the first couple months here? Uh, it's awesome. I love it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's challenges like, you know, sleep for instance, but I mean, we're kind of blessed, you know, like she's, she's really awesome. So, um, not really it doesn't really seem to like hockey so like good for her you know like you gotta forge your own path in this world you can't you know it's not about what i like so um i think she might be a swimmer you know big big time fan of watching olympic swimming so you never know i'm mean, gonna have like a future katie ledecky situation on our hands hey there you go. it's a hell of a time to sit them in front of a tv and just watch all of the weird sports like <laughs> squash like, yeah, yeah. Squash. you have to get her into like, curling when the winter olympics come around oh that's a given yeah that's 100 percent a given I mean, I was at Permanis yesterday watching uh, ping pong. So it's, uh, yeah, it's I'll tell you what, fun. <laughs> you know, here's a fun exercise if you're ever bored. Um, and I'm not saying like to actually bet on it, but look at some of the money lines for ping pong internationally. Like it's crazy. Like you'll see some people at like plus 2000 on the money line. It's just the wildest thing I've ever seen. Like if you, you know, if you're into sports gambling, don't bet the money line when it's plus 2000, but you know. Just literally sit back and watch it and enjoy it from afar. It really is just you're really good at uh, ping pong uncle against you as a kid at the uh, at the family <laughs> get together. And that's just what it is out there betting on. Yeah. Uh, but moving off the weird sports into the stuff we're here to really talk about, uh, the Penguins and hockey in general. But starting with the Seattle Kraken just took, you know, one former Penguin, one former Leaf, but also a former Penguin. Um, how do the Penguins go about filling the holes that were left by Tanev and McCann? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> Evan Rodriguez and Dominic Simone, no. Uh, I, yeah, I think, like, so, the, you know, Ron Hextall, like, probably one of the most, like, transparent, perhaps maybe the only transparent moment I think you've really had from him over the last month is when he said that he left the door open, you know, for Philip Hollander, I think. Um, no, not, and I want to be clear, because it's not, like, a, a quite a, a Jared McCann or a Brandon Tanev. Um in style or nature uh, but i think he has elements of his game that you know lend themselves to him being able to play in the bottom six in the national hockey league right now without any adjustment to north america and like i, I keep hearing that from some people like oh, he's got to take time to get used to the smaller rank disagree don't think he does won't be a problem for him um i think that he you know if you watch the tape he rarely used that extra space you know he was playing inside the hash pretty much the whole time. So with that in mind, like I, I really don't see there being this massive adjustment for him. I think that he took the time uh, off uh, while hurt um, to develop an, an elite shot, which is a bonus to his game that didn't exist when he was drafted by Pittsburgh initially. Uh, I think I think it's it's not a long shot for me. I think it's more of like... At this point, guys, I would say, like, if, if he doesn't get in, it's be, we should probably feel disappointed by that and probably question his status as a prospect. Because I think the door is that open. Um, and I think the hmm. sort of uh, pathway is laid for him. Um, I know other people ask about, like, Poland and, and Legary, but I think they need a little bit more extra time. Um, I don't think they're quite ripe yet, so to speak. Um, but, uh, yeah, for that that's probably one direction we go. The other question is, is like, there is there a, is there a hockey trade out there to be made? You know, I, Marcus Pedersen, Jason Zucker, you know, these are players that, um, you know, have, you know, potential, I think, to be moved and potentially recoup uh, filled out pieces elsewhere along the roster. So 
Uh, I know that there's, I don't want to say panic through the first 38 minutes of free agency. I had someone, I did have someone tweet me seven minutes in to tell me that it was an F for Ron Hextall, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> and like, what if you had taken your SATs and someone had ripped the test out of your hand while you were writing your name on it? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> That score is probably not representative of your actual mental skills. Uh, so I, I, I think that, that, that – but here's the, what I, reason I say that is because, like, the environment that Ron Hextall is in is one that I think is, like, a long game, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I've seen deals like the anti-Ranta deal at $2 million, You say, like, oh, man, like, the, that one had Pittsburgh written all over it. He may be working on something else, you know? Mm -hmm. um, what's going on with Darcy Kemper? You know, I think that's where Pittsburgh's attention probably – likely is and that's not a deal that has to get done today you know um i so have a little bit of patience i think some of this moves that are going to be made are going to have to come you know potentially from moving an actual roster piece mm -hmm. yeah i mean i have seen somebody tweet that ron hextall is the worst thing that happened to the penguins organization <laughs> in the last 30 <laughs> minutes which made me chuckle a little bit but as you mentioned hextall kind of has been looking at the trade market and it's kind of tipped his hand that he's looking at the trade market to replace a goaltender. And you mentioned the fact that Pedersen might be on the move. We've seen Marino's not in quite as good standing with this front office as he was with the Rutherford front office. So it seems like the trade market is where the answer at goalie is going to come from. Who at this point do you see as the lead candidates for Pittsburgh? You mentioned Kemper. Is there any other names you think that could be out there for Hextall and company? Uh, Linus Allmark still one um, that I think is a potential possibility that uh could could get done if the price is right mm -hmm. um i'm not gonna say mark andre Fleury. i'm sorry oh. you know it's such a bummer um i think that the you know the interest in that is largely player driven um and i think that that's what he wants to do but i don't think that that means that it's a feasible um you know or b something that the penguins have as their number one target right now and th that's also not something that needs to get done right away you know, if, if if Ron Hextall were to wait and options A, B, and C fell through, like then you can work on laundering money through Buffalo or something, you know, to, you know, make the cap functionality work. Um, but I, I still think that you're looking in that. I, I wasn't expecting the Penguins to be in like on Mrazic, um, where I think the bidding wars kind of like put them in a position where it's out of their range. Um, I still think the Kempers the, the, is the is the one that you know again like they have the pieces to make that work without having to sell assets you know because i i don't think ron hextall is an interest in taking any prospects out of the pipeline or any picks so that's kind of a, the kind of a deal you can make for a hockey trade and maybe you toss in like a late rounder to you know make it whole but um i, I still think that's kind of the direction and the population that we're heading in yeah what are you what um because you mentioned Flurry there, what are your thoughts on the whole Flurry in Chicago situation, especially with yeah. how you know horrible things are going are happening in Chicago? But they're still trying to seemingly build uh, a feasible hockey team there with um, a hell of a contract for Jones and bringing in Tyler Johnson. What's the whole Flurry in Chicago situation thing look like to you? I'm I don't think he plays there. Personally, I just don't see a way to that. Um, you know, I, I feel bad. I, let's really t take a second. And we all know, like, the, the trials and tribulations he went through in Pittsburgh, right? Like, that's all well documented. We know that there was a period of time where, like, Tomas Vokun, you know, had, you know, usurped the net. And that's not to say he wasn't without his issues there, you know. But if you go back, like, all the way to his gen – really his 17-year-old year, -old year uh, in the World Junior Championships, you know – this stuff's kind of followed him everywhere he's gone. You know, I think at the end of the day, you know, getting, you know, uh, the expansion draft, you know, sort of jettisoning him from Pittsburgh and, and before he wanted to go and you probably would have liked to have retired here. And then the Vegas situation, even, even losing the starting net to Matt Murray, you know, it's just been like this really rough run of, uh, I don't want to say respect because I, I think he got treated with respect in Pittsburgh. You know, Mike Sullivan, I think, did a masterful job of handling a two goalie situation and the way that that rotation broke down. And, you know, but that this to me was just unacceptable. Like, you know, he won the Vezina trophy. Right. <laughs> OK. Like and I understand his agent tweeted out, you know, some not so great stuff 
and you can't, you know, that's not him. You know, you can't put that on Marc Andre Fleury. But he won the Vizina Trophy. He's been an awesome humanitarian. He's one of the reasons that the launch of your franchise went as well as it did. <laughs> not just from mm-hmm. a performance perspective, right? But from like a sell tickets because people know who this is perspective. Yeah. For him to find out like that was just such a bummer to me, you know, he, and, and Elliot Friedman, I thought, tweeted out something relatively interesting last night and that the conversation with Chicago initially started July 12th. Why don't you pick the phone up on July 12th right then and say like, hey, uh, Mark, we're talking about this, not saying it's going to happen, but we want to give you time to think about it and prepare and I'll update you as we go. That's the right thing to do because then he gets two weeks to make a decision on what he wants to do instead of logging online and like, oh, found out on Twitter, you know, like, (laughs) so that was a big, that was a big time bummer to me. You know, I don't, I wouldn't, honest to goodness, blame anybody who didn't want to be in Chicago right now for any plethora of reasons, (laughs) Uh, you know, as far as what they've got going on and that ugliness. So um, for me, I think he'll either get a move forced you know, one that's fair to all parties, or I think he'll ultimately retire, which would stink because That'd he's be so awful. close, you know, to breaking. Um, you know, I, actually, I, mean, I don't want to rule out him playing for Chicago. And I guess, mm-hmm. you know, maybe that is a possibility. I just don't get the sense, but I don't get the sense that Vegas has facilitated that happening based on how they've, they've begun the relationship, you know, like it's unfortunate for Chicago that it's gone this this crappy it's not like they can call him and say like hey we're trading for you uh you know so i i I think that it just soured so badly right out of the gate uh that to me there's probably no end in sight there for for them at least as far as a a healthy relationship i mean less than 10 wins away from career win number 500 the career that he has had coming straight off of a enough for it to end in that fashion would be that's... I wouldn't say horrible because it is technically his own terms of like, all right, you know what? I don't want to play, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be done. But at the same time, to just be traded away from some place that you really like to being like, well, I don't want to play here, so I guess I'm forced to retire would be an awful way to end a Hall of Fame career. Yeah. But definitely a lot of talk about goaltending for the Pittsburgh Penguins. But other than that, what areas do you think the Penguins need to address moving forward? They re-signed... Evan Rodriguez on his birthday on the first day of free agency, as well as bringing back Dom Simone, as we alluded to a little bit earlier. But other than goaltender and those depth four positions, do you think there's an area the Penguins need to really look at moving forward this offseason? They got to continue to fill the wing out. Um, Mm -hmm. Zero question about that. Uh, I I think that, and I'm not saying, you know, go out and swing for, you know, the fences here, but, you know, like a, you know, I think about a Grandlin, you know, like who got obviously it was been picked up since, but names like that that are going to be in that like two to three and a half range. That's mm-hmm. probably like your peak, I think, of what you're out there aiming for in a wing. And again, don't discount it coming through trade, right? I still mm-hmm. think that that's probably the most the most likely end here. Um, but I, you know, again beyond, I mean, Drew O'Connor is what he is, you know, as an energy guy. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what you're going to get out of Dominic Simone. I mean, it's why it's a two way deal. You know, that's a, that's a big injury. And, you know, I don't know that he had enough to sacrifice, you know, in the agility and speed department. So you'll see what happens there. Evan Rodriguez, again, great depth, you know, but, but at the end of the day for me, um, I just, I think you got to have a little bit more on the wing. You got to have more NHL reliable depth there. And even if that's just one body, uh, I think that that makes a monumental difference. Could a guy like uh, Pittsburgh boy Brandon Saad be uh, a person for that sort of situation? I don't think so. Uh, you know, to me, it's kind of like, it, again, it's it's not going to be something that would be super cost friendly to the Penguins. Uh, I, they'd have to, you know, th- there'd have to be a lot that would happen there from a money perspective. I think, too... This is the one this it's not even so much that it's it's more for me that I think Brandon Sod's looking for term. This might I mean conceivably be his last contract, right? Like it could, could be. Yeah. So I don't know if the Penguins are in a position where they're willing to give out term, considering, you know, Brandon Tanev's now gone because of term. 
Uh, you know, that was the exact reason they lost him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, to me, it's, uh, you know, I, I think that rules them out just because he's probably looking for, for a decent security blanket. And I'm just going to ask it real quick. What are, like, so you've already kind of alluded to your thoughts on Dom Simone and everything. What do you have any more to expand on with uh, this return with his big return? <laughs> No, I mean, you know, he, it's always been a situation where it is what it is, you know, like he doesn't score goals, you know? Okay. Like we get that. So it depends, your feelings on Dom Simone ultimately depend on whether or not you are okay with him not scoring. Like that's what it comes down to. And I'm not here to tell you goal scoring is not important. That would be stupid. Goal scoring is what wins hockey games. It's necessary. It's literally required. <laughs> for you to win <laughs> okay but that being said you're not as much of in control of goal scoring as you pro people probably think they are uh players get hot goalies get hot goalies get cold players get cold the process that happens behind that the rate at which you can shoot the puck the rate at which you can control the scoring chances you can rely on that and hang your hat on, and Sidney Crosby will tell you this. I'm not telling you anything Sidney Crosby himself would not say. You can hang your hat on that and be like, look, things may not be going my way right now, but I have a process behind me that is staunch, solid, and I feel great about it, right? Mm -hmm. That's what Dominic Simone gives you a bump on is your process, right? Like however your feelings you know, work for him you know, one way or the other, it's tangibly proven that putting him in certain situations makes other players have more opportunities to score. Like, I live with that, you know? Like, cool. He may not put them in himself. He's probably going to whiff on an empty netter or two. It's, like, super frustrating. Be like, what the hell? I could have done that myself. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's like everybody has a role, right? You know, I, I, if, if for me, you're giving Sidney Crosby two or three more chances a game, cool like i'm fine with that and i think that at the end of the day that's really what it comes down to and he's sort of become you know unfortunately like this centerpiece for this analytical argument that i don't even think should exist because counting things is not controversial right like that's not controversial to, to say like in x situation Sidney crosby has three more scoring chances what's hot about that take you know like ah so that's it for me I, to me it's just it's depth it's good depth it's necessary depth you know, I like that they have the two-way insurance on it. If, you know, things don't work out, you yeah. know, you can, you know they, they, that, that's a nice thing to lay your hat on from a cap perspective. But to me, that's really what it comes down to. Shifting from the near future to a little bit further down the road, what can you tell us about the Penguins' second-round pick in Tristan Braz? Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm excited about him. Um, to kind of paint, like, a picture of the direction I think that he's heading in, coming out of of Fargo, you know, he was good all year long. Um, probably, I think, always is going to be a little bit more of a playmaker. But, you know, it's one of those situations where he's got a good shot and you kind of sit there and say to yourself, like, man, I really wish you'd use that a little bit more. You know, like, mm -hmm. like there are these head-turning moments where you're like, where did that come from? But it's not really what he predicates his game on. He's more of a tempo uh, controller for me. And I, I think when he blossomed, you know, in the playoffs this year uh, in the USHL, you know, it was really when he, I think he learned how to manipulate time and space. You know, you think about a guy like, and look, I'm not saying it's Sidney Crosby, just follow me for a second here, but like, you think about the way Sidney Crosby can like change the flow of a game, right? Mm -hmm. Slow time down and draw defenders in and manipulate them and force lanes to open up. He figured that part out in the playoffs and saying like, okay, if I, if I go full board in the offensive zone, whoa up, and then wait, this happens. Or if, if I put my shoulder down and drive around this guy, I have a lateral lane this way. And it was almost like, he, he was like, I'm better than everybody else. You know, I'm better than everybody else. And I'm going to be the one that's going to just, you know, be the conductor. So it was great. Uh, that was awesome. Um, really, really, really good in terms of keeping his head up and assessing the play. Never a head down skater, like always just thinking one or two steps ahead. 200 foot guy, you'll find him. Yeah, I think it's just important you know, given the style of game he plays, but uh, you'll find them everywhere on the ice. I love that Minnesota is, is going to be a really good place for, for him to go and kind of, mm -hmm. you know, set his roots down. And, um, you know, I, I, somebody asked me like, where does he slot in now? You know, like today uh, in the Penguins prospect org, mm -hmm. 
you know, I don't, that's a tough one to answer because he's so raw and so young, you know, but if he goes to Minnesota and has a good first year and puts up decent numbers with the ice time he gets, I think you put him in the top 10. So, you know, Hey, that's pretty decent. And he mm-hmm. put him in the close, maybe even in, you know, closer to the top five. So, I mean, for me, you know, Burroughs is a good kid. I mean, it's a good 200 foot player that is a safe pick. Uh, maybe lacks like some of the pop that you have from like a top end prospect. Um, but I think is, is one that you could look at and be like, yeah, even in a bottom six role, you know, in a future state, like I, that that's pretty, I don't want to say reliable, but you feel pretty good about it. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of was said about the Penguins only having five picks and of those five picks, three of them being in the seventh round, but yeah. of those three seventh rounders, which one do you think at this moment, would have the best chance of making it to the NHL where they're at now. I mean, I like Kirill Tankov the most. You know, mm-hmm. it's the most intriguing story, I think, in the draft is a lot of pro scouts think that he should have been picked last year, right, from a skills perspective. Mm-hmm. But, like, it's funny to watch him play in that he just doesn't care about the system at all in any way, shape, or form. He's playing on the left side. You'll find him over on the right. He'll take the puck <laughs> off a teammate. Like he'll take the puck behind his own net on the breakout and just not even look at anybody else. And when it works, you end up with this really dope YouTube highlight montage that you guys have probably seen. Like, and you think like, holy smokes. But then when it doesn't work, it's really bad. Um, and I'm not here to say like he's a head case or he's stupid or he doesn't listen. That's just the nature. You know, that's it's cage. It's the second division of the cage up. Right. Right. So it's like, it's like the Quebec major junior league on, you know, steroids in terms of, you know, cheating up ice and stuff like that. it's not all that out of the ordinary, you know, but I don't know that he really want, I don't know that he wants to come over. You know, I don't even know if he has that desire. Um, you know, he is a, is a unique prospect to me though, because there are just certain things that you can't teach people to do. Right. Uh, mm. most of them he's got, um, I think that, you know, that's one that you're looking for a longer term, probably a return on investment. Um, but it's going to be fun to watch what happens because I mean, it, you know, if you're going to look if to me anyway, if you have that many seventh rounders, don't try to go get, you know, Joe uh, Smith from Ontario, you know, you're checking, you're checking line, you know, OHL player that scored eight goals, go get this guy, you know, swing for the fences, you know, like, make it work you know like that's that's what i love to see is that the level of sort of like um we're gonna take a chance on this that's awesome i loved every every ounce of it and i'm looking forward to putting together more of those ridiculous montages later in the future how would you grade the penguins draft as a whole i know it was kind of hard whenever it's three seventh rounders but you know overall with what we had what do you think it was i can't i guess if you were to grade it outside the scope of – well, ah, C. I think it's a C only because I don't – you know, Tankov was, was, you know, a fun one. Bros is a safe – like I said, a safe pick but lacks pop. Um, I just don't – I don't know that they, they really did anything that made you go like, whoa, whoa. You know, like, I can't believe that happened. They got good value in some spots, you know, like they drafted some guys ahead of where they were ranked, but – just by nature of the limited number of picks they had, I think it's tough to give them anything more than that. You know, it was just sort of like they went in, did it, did a good, decent bit of business and then left. So maybe like B minus at that perspective, like C plus, but it's just, they're handcuffed by circumstance really more than yeah. anything else. Yeah. That's kind of, yeah. that's really what hurt and why I was hoping to get an opinion on. But aside from the obvious pool and lag array and the ones we just mentioned, who are some of the other key prospects that, uh, fans should really keep an eye keep an eye on in the system and when do you think some of these guys will reach the nhl if it's in the near future yeah valtteri pustin is really the big one who's kind of like a little bit of an enigma you know um uh insane insanely talented you know I was, what i was saying earlier about philip hollander not really needing to make an adjustment to north american ice because he doesn't necessarily utilize the extra space pustin does and i don't think that's a bad thing I think if you have a player, you know, we hear this word perimeter, and I think sometimes it's like it's got this like bad, you know, um, connotation to it, if you will, right? But I like that he uses the space well. It's productive, you know what I mean? Like it, 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 
you know, that's you want him to take it wide on a guy when he has the opportunity. You want him to use his hands when he has the opportunity. I just think that with less space for him, it's going to force more physical engagement, which really isn't necessarily his strength. Um, you know, I, I, I guess people have referred to him as like people would say like, well, he's like the poor man's Phil Kessel. That's kind of true, right? Like that that's what his game is about, is about his shot. And you can't mm-hmm. teach people to shoot like that and dangle like that. Um, but I think there's other areas that could probably be rounded out a little bit more. I think the fact that, you know, he hasn't really gotten a lot of experience in, in some of the larger stages, you know, we'll see how it goes when he goes to the pro game. Um, but it's fun. I mean, again, like something to keep an eye on that's going to be fun to watch. He's going to go to the AHL next year. Um, and we get to watch how that translation occurs. So it's definitely one for me to keep an eye on. Is there anyone, you got a small sample on anyone else? Um, I, this one is a little bit less sexy and I'll be honest with you. Like I, I, <laughs> like, I don't, uh, I wouldn't be shocked if anybody like kind of shot, like scoffed at this or, or whatever, but, um, I like Rivas Anson's and he's going to go pro too. Um, he was just really like in a, in a really crappy situation. Um, you know, uh, by the way, that's the 2025th. Uh, rounder 149th overall that played with Nathan Legary. Um, that's how the Penguins, I think, you know, pretty had so much familiarity with him was his time in, in Bicomo and playing with Legary. But you know, Legary gets traded to Valdor. Um, you know, he plays, you know, essentially on, again what is really just an awful team. Um, didn't really have like the best stats out of the queue this year but went to Zem, uh, Zemgal in Latvia and played on loan there and played at almost a point per game average in their highest mm-hmm. division so Latvia right like let's chill out that's where he's from you know like <laughs> it's like but like that's a good sign like you yeah. you like that like that's a good mm-hmm. sign so he's huge right like he's just a big player uh 6-1 like um, probably buck 95 now uh not a bad skater though not a player that like you know, you look at and say that he's out of place I think he there's look at the end of the day, there's not, this isn't a player you're going to put in the top six ever. Right. But this is a player who I think slots in perfectly with Teddy Bluger, who slots in perfectly in that, that what the penguins have built for their bottom six. He's great for it. Super good defensively, physical, good for checker, limited offensive skill. There's a place for that on this team. And, and I, you know, I'm excited to see what happens with his pro debut this year as well. I mean, that ex- explanation that you just gave kind of just reminds me of where Redeem Zahorna is now. Do you think he's yeah. going to be a fixture in the lineup this year, or do you think that there's still more room for him to grow before he can become a regular? He's probably a player that I don't think has a lot left to take away from like an extended drink of water in the American Hockey League. So, mm-hmm. um, but I also don't know that he's a player that the Penguins see a lot of use for outside of spot time. So mm-hmm. you, you're in that tweener stage, you know, yeah. where like you're almost a quad A guy. Um, that's kind of where he is right now. So I would probably expect him to get time once it opens up from the inevitable injury crisis that will occur as it does every year. Mm-hmm. Um, but that being said, I, uh, I, and I do like his horn as a player. Right. But I just think again, you know, that's, that's more of like a, uh, you're limited to like a bottom six type of a deployment with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, we couldn't let you go without asking you a quick uh, off-the-wall question here. So the Southside Burger King made news again the other night. Yeah, I heard about this. And uh, with with the workers walking out, I just wanted to have you retell the story, the long history, if we, if we can, <laughs> of the Southside Burger King, for those who may not know, because it's a legendary Pittsburgh fixture of the nightlife. Yeah, and it turns out, like, I came to find out well after the fact, that sometime around the beginning of the pandemic initially, that – the guys from Piper's kept the signage. So the fake Burger King signage that was hanging up on the side of the building during that time has actually been preserved. So there's a really vital piece of Pittsburgh history that is going to live on forever, courtesy of the work of the guys from Piper's. Um, that's actually, Piper's is actually, I think most people's, how I found out about its story when it comes to Southside Burger King. And I specifically use that name because that was the title of the restaurant, Southside Burger King. Um, basically, it's just it was a Burger King that lost its franchise, but the people there continued to operate as if it was a Burger King. Like (laughs) they didn't let you know that they were no longer officially a Burger (laughs) King. So like none of the stuff they were selling 
was from Burger King. And what happened was one day I got way, I had too many beers at Piper's and I go to do what I usually do, which is go to Burger King afterwards. Or they help soak up some of the brews, you know, get yourself mm-hmm. a nice little mm-hmm. thing. And I remember going in and I had a, a regular paper bag. There wasn't like a logo on it. There was nothing on it. And it was like the fries were different. There was like no napkins or utensils. And then like a week or two later, I found out that like they had been going to the giant eagle on the south side, <laughs> buying like regular fries and meats at the giant eagle, bringing them back over there. And when they ran out of paper bags, that became a big problem. They started to hand out food in like other bags from like CVS and stuff. People <laughs> caught on. Um, and then it eventually somehow or another became a franchise again, like right after that, it went back to being a Burger King shortly thereafter. But like, I always say to people, like, you have to know what you're getting into or like what kind of state and I look, I'm wearing this cause I did it all the time, but you have to have some kind of understanding of what kind of state your life is in. If you're going to that Burger King, you know what I mean? Like to, to initially step foot in there, even before it became a mysterious non-franchise business, you were doing like you were your life was in a in a state <laughs> you know it was probably a weird hour you're probably intoxicated like so most people i think just didn't even know you know because it was just uh they weren't you know for them it was just sort of that was they were they were already out to lunch you know <laughs> it's even before the whole story of it it's just the wildest burger king you could ever see the drive through is under a tunnel a tunnel, a yeah, tunnel. yeah. yeah. A the tunnel wildest drive I've ever seen, yeah. and it's just an extension of the rest of the building. Here's basically. the thing, too, Nick. That tunnel is is ne- e- e- even in the the midst of a summer month where it hasn't rained in 45 days. That tunnel's leaking something. There's something coming out of there. Where's that liquid coming from? I don't know. It hasn't rained in a month. Exactly. Somewhere there's a, wa- a runoff, perhaps <laughs> natural spring of some sorts. I don't know, but it's still wild. Keep I love your windows up. You have to keep your windows up when you go through. Jim was like, you roll the window down, they hand your car down, and then put your window back up because you're getting splashed every time. You're getting splashed. That's the exhaust from the building. They just actually just like funnel it through and just let it yeah. mist down on our customers. That's what that's what what's yeah. gonna work. Hey, it made the fries taste better. So, <laughs> I don't mean. Fair enough. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jesse, yep. for giving us your time, especially on probably one of the busiest days of the year uh, for you, especially being free agent day. But is there anything coming out for the athletic that our listeners should be looking out for from you? Uh, yeah, I did take some time to take um, a lot of that video of Tristan Bros and put it together so that we can uh, to sort of experience some of that maturation of the playoffs that I was talking about. So that should be out soon. I'm still piecing that video together, but uh, we'll be uh, breaking down some of those picks in a little bit more in depth. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us. And uh, hopefully we get you on during the season for your third appearance here. And hopefully we can watch some Philip Hollander highlights in the black and gold. Love it. Thanks, guys. All right.